Professor Seyfried, you were saying that glucose and um, glutamine. glutamine are feeding the cancer cells. So if we can construct a diet so that we don't eat, get glucose, what, what can we do to stop um, putting glutamine in our body and get it out? You can't do it. That's the problem. It's, you, you can't do it. It's not possible. So, because the uh, glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in the body, and it can be made from other, other sources. It's, it's called non-essential. So, your body makes it. You can make it from glucose, as a matter of fact. Even so, plants, you get glutamine from. Yeah, so it's not, you need, what we need drugs, unfortunately. But the drugs can be specific and in low dose, as long as it's working with all of the other things. So, there's no way in the diet you're going to target glutamine. So, as far as I know, I, no one's, it's just, it's just, glutamine is such an important amino acid, part of the urea cycle, you know, it's part of our immune system, our gut needs glutamine, glutamine is like, and the cancer cell needs glutamine. So, in the last 500 patients that you're aware of who followed this protocol, what happened? Did they, were they able to do better than traditional cancer patients by following this no glucose, glu, glu, glutamine? No one has done this. It hasn't been done. Uh, we were the first to try it on a brain cancer patient, but we used chloroquine and EGCG, which that's the green tea extract. Um, it's not as powerful. There are the drugs out there, 6 diazo norlucine but they're toxic, but you have to know how to use them. It's very low. You have to know how to strategically use them to not harm the body. There are drugs available. I, I think it's going to have to come down to a, a combination of very uh, healthy nutritious foods, and specific kinds of drugs. That, and it has to be done strategically. You have to, somebody has to know how to do this. So if someone followed the exact protocol that you believe would work best, what would you predict would be their success rate against cancer versus traditional cancer treatments? You know, it's hard to say because, I mean, we know Let's put it this way. We can't know until we do the correct kinds of studies. And right now, in the big hospitals, we have standard of care, standard of care with metabolic therapy. Metabolic therapy includes targeting glucose and glutamine, maintaining the correct nutritional balances that you need. And the missing group from all of the studies that have been done to my mind and is the key control group with metabolic therapy without standard of care. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the They're missing hard group. Hard to find. And you can't get anybody to do it. No hospital will allow it. Exactly. Right? So the very organization that needs to be involved with this is part of the problem. And, that, and without that group, we cannot answer specifically your question. The only way that it could be done is to do what Dr. Esselstyn did with heart disease, which is basically People go to him who are volunteering. They're saying, yeah. I don't want any more drugs. I don't want to have any more procedures. I'm going to do what you say. And then he's followed him for 32 years. And that, that's the only way I see it happening. So we're starting to do that. Yeah. We're starting a cancer. We're enrolling cancer right. patients in a survey program yeah. to track them and their decisions so that someday, probably after I'm long gone, we'll be able to answer that question. Uh -huh. But the, you're right, because they, it's considered unethical Yes. to not give patients treatments, even if they don't work, if it's the standard of care. Mm -hmm. So you can't right. have that control room. Well, that's, then we have to come to the changing of the policy, mm -hmm. and that what I'm doing is writing case reports and publishing them in the literature, which allow physicians to look and say, you know, maybe we should do this on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's one of the ways we can, because you gotta break, you gotta break the system the way it is, because it's not working for so many people. And, and I think, you, we need the groups, uh, and, and the scientific evidence is there. It's not like this is all um, uh, unknown. I mean, there's thousands of research papers to say that this will work. It's just that it hasn't been done. And who pays for this, right? When you do a clinical trial, there's a lot of issues. You have to have a hospital that buys on. You have to have a sufficient amount of money to, do, to pay the physicians, to recruit the patients. Um, who, who wants to pay for a possible therapy that may not generate the same degree of revenue that other therapies generate? Right. <laughs> That's the yes. problem. Yes. 
right? So I had, I had a patient, I, when I, I gave a talk at a hospital up in, up in Michigan, Sparrow Hospital actually, and I was telling people this, and one of the radiation guys got so angry, he, he, he wanted to leave. And I asked him later, I said, why, why, why are you so angry? He said, well, if this stuff you're talking about, we're gonna have to close half the hospitals in the country because radiation generates so much revenue, it keeps the other processes going. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, what the, I, I don't know how to address that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So can this you, is, you're you up against we, a, we a, so, a revenue generation system yeah, we, as well. We devalue human life to such a point. What happened to these young doctors? I mean, I don't know a doctor that did not get into it for the right reason. When you're 18, 19 years old, you don't say, hey, I want to go through 12 years of education and make a fairly poor salary. They did it for the right reason. But somehow that whole process. Uh, I had in my office four years ago uh, a former dean, and I won't name the school, of a major Ivy League medical school. And his wife had come to us and reversed liver cancer. And he came in and he was so you know, elated that we healed his wife. And after he talked for about a minute, I said, number one, how long have you been married? And he said, 38 years. I said, okay. I said, you know, have you learned to respect your wife? Oh, yes, I respect her. I said, then how do you think I healed her? Go out and hug her. She healed herself. And you should be lucky because God forbid she died. You wouldn't know what to do. And he finally laughed. You know, he was first offended and then he laughed. Then he was walking out and he said, I'll do anything to help you. And I said, no, no, no. I said, wait a minute. Come and sit down. And I said, what happens when you're training oncologists? Is it intentional that you get people to immediately act on the protocol? And he said, yes. He said, if we give anyone a patient time to think about what happened with their father, their mother, their neighbor, their cousin, through the treatments that we're offering, most people would back out of it. So I heard it from the horse's mouth to say. Number two are one of my team members, Dr. Maharaj, one of the most notable stem cell doctors on the planet Earth. Uh, he and I have had the conversation about glutamine, and he suspects that in the future, he's not quite sure, he's playing with it now, there's ways to overwhelm the glutamine with fresh cells, stem cells. And he's more so focused on the brain because glutamine is a, a, a critical part of brain function at this point. And too much glutamine in the brain equals what? Alzheimer's disease. So it doesn't only create cancer conditions, there's a whole array, and I think we're gonna learn more as time goes on with these things. So possibly stem cells will be an answer, but at this point we don't know that. 